So today we're going to be talking about extreme thinking. Extreme thinking is, is something that plagues those who are overcoming complex trauma. Uh, extreme thinking is also something that you will see in those who are very young. Yes, children. Extreme thinking actually is derived from childhood because children are unable to totally process the complexities of life. So children tend to look at things in very simple terms, black and white, right and wrong. But as we grow into adulthood, we want to get to the point where we're able to see things as they really are. That is to process the complexities of life. So how do you think you're doing in this area? I want you to imagine, if you will, you go to buy a television at a big box electronic store. And when you arrive, they inform you that the latest version of the television is now in black and white. How would you feel? Would you be excited to buy a television in 2022 that's in black and white? Perhaps you would be disappointed, but why don't you want a black and white TV? The picture's crystal clear. And after all, people used to use black and white TV. So, so why for you is that something that you find to be disappointing? Possibly you may say, well, I don't want a black and white TV because I want to see the full color. I want to see, all, you know, there, there, there's, there's more definition and, and, and quality in the picture if I can see everything the way it was meant to be seen. Or you might say, I don't want to see uh, my, my pictures in black and white because I like for things I watch on television to look as real as possible. And that doesn't look real if it's just in black and white. But just like you cannot accept a black and white picture on your television, that is the same way you should feel about your thinking. You cannot accept a subpar, lower quality version of thinking, just as you wouldn't accept a subpar electronic or television. The way that you think needs to be of the highest quality standards to the highest degree, right? Because isn't our mind so much more important than a mere toy, a television? So we want to make sure that our standards are high, not just for the electronics that we buy, but for the most important computer we own, which is our brain. To that end, we must get away from black and white thinking. That is dichotomous thinking. Dichotomous thinking is basically thinking in extremes. Instead of seeing things in what is called shades of gray, or if you will, in color, they're just seeing things in black and in white, the extremes. Something is either right or it's totally wrong. A person is either good and they're like my best friend and they're amazing and I want to be like, just like them, or I hate them. They are trash. They are garbage. They are the worst I never, I never want to see them again. I never want to hear from them again. Extreme thinking. That's dichotomous thinking. It's missing all of the beautiful colors of the rainbow. And just looking at this extreme on this end or this extreme on the other end. Let's take, for instance, perfectionists. Do we have some perfectionists in the room with us today? I'll bet we do. Because perfectionists are trying their best all the time, even when they don't have to. A perfectionist is thinking in extremes. They don't just accept the idea that, oh, I could just do my project and turn it in. And they'll know that, you know, I spent a reasonable amount of time on it. And I'll feel good that uh, I got it done. No, no, not for a perfectionist. For a perfectionist, it has to be the best project that was possible to make. But the problem 
is when you approach things with the idea that they have to be the absolute best, it's hard to get all that stuff done because the best is a lot of work. And so if you're a perfectionist who likes to clean your house to the highest standards, then cleaning your house is a big task. And if you're a perfectionist who has to have the best car also clean to the highest standards, that's another big chore. Then laundry becomes a big chore. Then personal grooming becomes a big chore. And everything becomes this overwhelming task because you are trying to be perfect in a world where perfection doesn't actually exist. Perfectionists will push themselves beyond the point of what's healthy, beyond the point of what's reasonable. But perfectionists are doing this because like all extreme thinkers in their childhood, they got an impression that they were going to need to go all out or they are going to be worthless. They're going to need to overachieve because if they don't achieve to the highest standards that just blows everyone away, then they're a failure. It's extreme thinking, black and white. Some people, when they get upset with someone or they get upset with themselves, they don't just say, you know, I'm a little disappointed in that person or I'm a little disappointed in myself. No, they say, I just want to kill myself. Or I just want to kill him. <laughs> and so they actually start plotting the homicide of their friend, boyfriend, spouse, sister, brother because of extreme thinking or plotting the suicide of their own self. For what? Because your credit card went overdue or because someone thought something wrong about you? In, in order to adapt to life in a world full of complexities, we must have the ability to avoid extreme thinking. Otherwise, we will end up committing a homicide or a suicide. We would never want that. Extreme thinkers like to go to the absolute worst case scenario. That is catastrophizing. So it's like, okay, well, my son said he'd be home at four o'clock and it's four oh, it's four oh five. Oh my gosh, he's probably dead by now. He may have gotten kidnapped. I just know just the worst possible thing must have happened to him. He must have got hit by a car on the way home and there was no one around and there was no way. It's extreme thinking. In order for us to adapt within this world, we have to be able to pull that level of thinking down into a way that will allow us to communicate, reach out and figure out what the actual solution to the problem is. The reason people default to black and white thinking is stems back to their childhood. In their childhood is when the, uh, they're working with just their subconscious mind, the brainstem, what scientists call the animal brain. So if you're working in your animal brain, everything's kind of uh, pleasure, pain, uh, right, wrong, I want to, I don't want to. And, but of course, as you grow up, you can't continue to exist in that, in that realm, right? Because you can't just say, no, I don't want to eat my vegetables because I don't like vegetables, right? You have to say, well, even though I don't like these foods, they're good for me. That's a part of maturity. It's like that emotionally as well. Complex trauma victims, oftentimes in their, in their, in their childhood, they had caregivers that were insensitive or emotionally immature themselves that didn't create an environment for that survivor to be able to grow and develop their powers of reasoning and their ability to sort of be uh, thoughtful, mindful, conscientious, and emotionally intelligent. Because parents were extremely harsh or extremely praising, they felt like there really was no middle ground. There's a lot of reasons why people cling to black and white thinking even in adulthood. 
One of the reasons is because it's just easier. When you can ignore the fact that the world has all these complexities, it feels like you can sort of make decisions with more ease, right? Because, hey, just tell me what to do. Do you want me to do it or not? Is this right or is it just wrong? Is that a bad guy? Is that an unsafe person? Or is that a good, safe person? Unfortunately, the amount of decisions you need to make as an adult and the weight that these decisions have, it doesn't lend itself well to not being able to process the complexities of real life. So we must abandon as we become older extreme thinking. Extreme thinking is all or none, always or never. Just starting with that language, we can already start to be mindful when we're in extreme thinking mode. Because extreme thoughts precipitate extreme emotions. So if you're going to be thinking extreme, then what's going to happen to your emotional state? What's going to follow is anxiety, depression, or out of control anger. Because you're always in extremes. And those extreme thoughts lead to extreme emotions. What we have to understand about life philosophically is there, there is not normally a, something that's totally good or something that's totally bad. There is no totally right and totally wrong, except on a basis of comparison. Good and bad exists on a basis of comparison. Right and wrong exists on a basis of comparison. And, and I'll illustrate to help you understand what I'm saying. Initially, when you're working in your, in your subconscious mind, in your, in your brainstem, uh, you make snap judgments on black and white thinking. So if I say, is killing good or bad? Well, you would say probably killing's bad. But if you stop and you recognize that life is complex, and then I ask you again, is killing good or bad? Is killing right or wrong? you might start to recognize that that's not as easy as a question as it sounds initially. Because there's scenarios and situations in which killing could be more permissible than others, right? Like if someone is, is a, someone bigger and stronger is attacking your frail wife or your frail daughter, and you need to fend off the attacker, and in your process of fending off the attacker, that person were to die, that killing might be more justified than you just killing to take revenge. Would you agree? So then there's some types of killing that isn't as bad as other types of killing. So if someone were to just kill someone because they wanted their tennis shoes, that would be more morally reprehensible than someone that killed someone to defend themselves or to defend a loved one? Or what if uh, your family member is on life support, but they're suffering? So you're asked if you should, if the doctor should pull the plug on the life support, which is the only thing that's sustaining the life of the person. The person otherwise would not be able to continue living without the machinery which is also very costly and expensive to keep running. And you have to make the decision whether you pull the life support, thus killing the person, or if you allow the person to continue suffering, which the doctors have informed you the person is very much in pain. What do you do? It's not so black and white. It's not so simple as to just say, well, killing's always wrong. Every scenario is going to require a special analysis and to that aim, you need to acquire as much data as possible in order to make a determination. Because your, your aim should not be just to make sure that your thinking is uh, right 
or wrong. You want to make sure that your thinking is to the highest quality thinking. And in order for your thinking to be the highest quality thinking, you need as much information as possible because life is very complex. Same thing if I were to say, what about stealing? Initial brainstem response, you might say something like, stealing's bad, stealing's wrong, it's always wrong. But if you're starting to train those perceptive powers of critical thinking and realizing that life is complex and you bring the conscious mind, the cerebral cortex online, you analyze logically, you might start to realize, I need more information as to what you mean by stealing. You see, because if I'm walking down the street after having had my wallet stolen last week and I see my wallet sitting in someone else's car and their car happens to be unlocked and no one else is there and it's my wallet, you can bet I'm gonna go in that car and I'm gonna steal that wallet right back. I'm gonna put it in my pocket and I'm gonna keep on walking and I will not lose a lick of sleep over my crime, over my having stole something. So is stealing wrong? Is stealing bad? It depends, right? When we get out of extreme thinking, now we can start actually processing the complexities of life because life is just not that simple. We're not children anymore. This is not ABCs, pick red, blue, or yellow. This is figure out whether in this particular scenario, this stealing is justified or not. If I'm in black and white thinking, I might see my own wallet sitting there and say, oh no, stealing's bad. <laughs> and, and then I sit there and the guy comes out and he gets in the car and drives off with my wallet and I never see it again. Mm, that's not high functioning. That's not adaptive thinking. In order to be able to function in this world, we have to be able to process that things are going to fall on a scale. So stealing with a selfish aim, such as uh, because I wanted to have the newest shoes, so I saw that the store had the newest shoes in stock, so I got it and I stole it for myself, is more bad or more morally reprehensible than stealing for an unselfish aim, such as I just needed formula for my baby. I planned on going back and paying them when I could. There are levels to everything. You're starting to get the picture. This is how we get out of thinking in extremes and get into thinking in the shades of gray, or as I like to say, the colors of the rainbow because life is more complex, right? So what would you say to lying? You're ready now, right? You would say it depends, right? Because there's some times when lying is absolutely wrong. And then there could be circumstances where you'd have to lie to save someone's life, for instance. It's all not so simple. So if you picture instead of just there being one line down the middle of of the universe and there's good on this side, bad on this side. If you just open that line up and you create lots of levels, then you can start to process things without going into extreme thinking. So you can ask yourself when, you, when you're in an extreme mode, what's a level down from that? So, oh, I just want to kill him. Okay. What's a level down from that? Well, hmm. I could poison him just enough so he suffers, but not quite kill him. Mm, better. Okay. What's a level down from that? Well, I could just, I could hit him really hard. We're getting better. We're getting better. We're getting less jail time every time here. So what's, what's a level down from that? Well, I could really just tell him off. I could tell him how I feel. Awesome. Now we're in no jail time. We're in no jail time. Let's get more adaptive. What's a level down from that? Mm, I could write him a letter letting him know how I feel. Ooh, that might actually be effective. You both get out your feelings and you do something that doesn't just cause an argument. A letter might be a really effective way of expressing yourself. It's adaptive thinking. You get the point? Bring yourself down. If you recognize there's levels to everything, then when you find yourself go initially to an extreme, just regulate it. 
Just bring it down. Okay, what's a level less than that? Do it for yourself as well. I just feel like I want to die. I should just kill myself. Okay, that's an extreme thought. What's a level down from that? Well, I just want to punish myself. Like, I feel like I, I shouldn't be alive, but if I can't kill myself, then I guess, um, I guess I can just try to improve myself. I could try to seek out help. I could try to reach out to, to us, to a professional. Yeah. Why don't I get on uh, the suicide hotline right now? more adaptive thinking. When we think more adaptively, it'll allow us to be more successful in our life. I'm not talking about just making money. I'm talking about having more successful relationships, being happier, being more joyful, being in less pain, not suffering from debilitating anxiety and sadness. Extreme thinkers get themselves into uh, what I call paradoxical thinking, or this is where you get stuck in a situation. Um, and I want to use a real, a real life situation. I hope this person won't be mad, but uh, so they were, um, they're not in the, in the room, by the way, but they might hear the recording later, <laughs> but, but they found themselves in a paradoxical thinking. They said, I can't, I can't go to sleep because uh, my, my, I have to take a shower before I go to sleep and okay, well, we'll then take a shower. Well, I can't take a shower because I need to clean my tub before I can take a shower. We'll clean the tub. I can't clean the tub because the drain's not working properly. Well, uh, fix the drain, get some Drano. I can't get Drano because the stores are closed because it's too late. And it being so late, I'm stressed out because I need to go to bed and I'm stuck in this paradox where no matter what I do, it's not going to work. There's a reason to not make any move. And so now I'm stuck. And their solution, stand in one place and just cry. That is not adaptive thinking, my friends. It's understandable. Our heart goes out to this person, but it's not adaptive thinking. It's not going to get you success in life. Adaptive thinking is to be able to break out of the paradox by recognizing that life is complex and in a complex world, that means there's not going to be a perfect solution to anything. So you're going to have to accept imperfection. I'll repeat this. You're going to have to accept imperfection, which means you may have to go to bed without having taken a shower once in your life. Or you may have to take a shower in a dirty tub once in your life. You may have to accept imperfection. It's okay to leave the dishes overnight once in a while. Imagine, it's okay if every single corner of your bathroom isn't perfectly scrubbed every single time. It's okay if your children didn't put all of the toys away. It's okay if you allow them to play in the living room. Imperfection is a part of the complexity of life. If you accept imperfection, you keep yourself from getting into paradoxical thinking. Accept some imperfection. Your goal is not perfection because just like black and white doesn't or rarely exist, perfection rarely exists, if, if it exists at all. You don't, you don't aim for something that's not real, like a unicorn. That's a fantasy. Perfection is a fantasy. Aim for something that's real, like good enough. When you cook dinner, you shouldn't try to make the perfect dinner. You should try to make a dinner that's good enough. Does that make sense? You should try to clean your house good enough. Raise your kids good enough. You don't have to say, I'm a bad mom because my kid got a D. That's extreme, extreme. You are a good enough parent. Work with him, get him a tutor. It's going to be okay. We're going to have to accept that imperfection exists in the world. And so to that aim, I'd like to give you guys a tool that you can use to fight this tendency towards extreme thinking. And it's going to be your QC list. It's called the quality control list. And so you want to picture yourself like you're an actual quality control worker at a factory, 
but the factory is going to be the factory of your mind where all thoughts are made and created. So whenever you have a thought, you want to use your quality control checklist to analyze these thoughts. And you can and you can certainly write these down and copy this list down for yourself. And maybe at a later date, I'll post it on the on our website as well. But your quality control checklist, you'll ask yourself, first of all, as far as this thought goes, is this thought high quality? Number one, what are the flaws? What are the exceptions? The flaws are if this is an argument, what would the opponent say? Is it scientifically accurate, right? So, so you might say, all men are trash. Okay, that's your thought. Now let's analyze it. What are the flaws? Well, it's a little extreme because I said all men and that might not totally be true because I haven't actually met all men. Therefore, I can't verify that that's scientifically accurate. And my opponents would say that I'm being sexist. <laughs> so, right now we've examined the flaws of, of the argument. Time to pull it down a couple notches, right? So what's the level below all men are trash? How about maybe <laughs> we bring it down to the point where we recognize uh, the better way to say that is uh, I haven't have, had good success in my relationships with men so far. Uh, that might be more, more accurate. Instead of saying, I don't trust anyone, what are the flaws? Well, anyone, that's extreme. And if I don't trust anyone, then I literally can't do anything. I wouldn't even be able to leave my house and go to the store because I wouldn't even trust the store to be able to price things accurately or the cashier not to steal my money. So, so maybe a better way to say this is um, I, I feel very vulnerable when I trust Um um, I've been exploited many times, right? Let's go for what's actually accurate. Make your statement accurate. Then it's a high quality statement. And you'll notice as a result, you get high quality feelings and emotional and, and an emotional state. The next one, list other possibilities. So your wife comes in, she doesn't say barely a hello. She doesn't give you a hug and kiss. And she just slams her purse down and goes and starts running a bath for herself. And you're like, what? Man, I cleaned up the house and everything. Why am I getting no attention from my wife? You know what? She must be cheating on me. <sighs> Hold on. Let's list the possibilities. Is it that your wife is cheating? Or could there be some other possibilities? Like maybe she's tired. Maybe she had a bad day. Maybe she needs food. Maybe she's hungry right? There could be hormonal issues, right? Which by the way, you might not tell her this is your list of possibilities, but you're helping to get your thoughts in order. And as you recognize, oh, you know what? Wow, there, there's more to this than meets the eye. So maybe I could be a little bit more sensitive and patient right now through this situation. And it calms down your emotional state. Now you don't do something silly because wouldn't it be silly for your wife to come home and she's in a mood, and then your reaction is to call her ex-boyfriend and be like, are you guys having sex? I know you are. See, that doesn't, that's not logical, right? But those illogical actions come from the illogical thoughts. So use the quality control checklist to make sure your thoughts are high quality so your actions will be high quality. Ask yourself, what is the evidence for and against this? Right. So if you, you did the job interview and then you get in your car and you're like, oh, I'm not going to get hired. I'm never going to find a job. Ah, put the brakes on, pull out the quality control checklist. What's my evidence that I'm not going to get hired? Well, she pressed her lips together and I answered a question wrong. OK, is there any evidence for the fact that you actually might get hired against your thought? Yeah, they really need help. And that's why they're interviewing. And I'm one of the only qualified people in this area. Okay, right. So as you think these things out, it levels out your thoughts and thus your emotional state. The next one says state one negative and one positive. So what you could do to state one negative and one positive is look at your situation. Like if you lost your job, you might say, I don't know how I'm going to replace my income. That's one of the negatives. 
but one positive is I have more time to be with my children or I can work on my book. And then your last one's there. Is it helpful? Is it true? Is it kind? We want our thoughts to be the highest quality way of thinking. We want to make sure our thoughts are high quality. So use the quality control checklist and make sure that you're thinking in the highest possible quality, utilizing the highest quality criteria to make your decisions. So that ends my portion. Now we want to open up our discussion uh, to those who are here with us today. And all you have to do is raise a hand up in the air. Um, there's like a little hand emoji that you can use. And then I'll call on you guys in order and uh, make sure everyone has their opportunity to participate in the discussion. So is there, uh, Jenny, start us off. Hi, Roman and everyone. Um, Hi, Jenny. Not sure about you guys, but when Roman does an analogy in the beginning, it's always like, oh, like it hits you. Um, but I, I have an example where I think I need your help. And if this is like, I don't want to take up too much time, but like I've been going through it as you've been teaching us things. And I'm like, oh, like, OK, I get it. And then I don't. Um, so long story short, I'm fostering a dog um, who it may or may not have eaten um, Adderall. And so in my past, like, and I like for everyone who doesn't know me, which is all of you, um, really love my dogs, like big vegan over here. Um, and so in the past, like my dog that passed away, he had eaten a flower and was really small and had to go to the ER and, um, thank God he did. Right. And so this dog might've eaten this pill and I checked with the foster team and then he seemed fine. But then they were like, call the ASPCA. And I kept saying like, he's fine, he's fine. Um, I just need one minute, sorry. Uh, uh, and as I'm talking to you guys, literally the vet walks in. But um, so the ASPCA basically is like, yeah, no, take him to the vet. And my boyfriend's like, you're overreacting. You're doing this to yourself. Like the dog is fine. Like he's completely fine. But I think about like my other dog that died and that's like where I go into the gray area. And then you send this checklist and I get lost and um, he's fine, right? Like I brought him here for no reason basically, but like maybe I should just support my thoughts more. Like I did the right thing or you know what I mean? Like maybe I am thinking in my highest version of myself and I should just feel good about that. You know, am I making sense everyone? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you're taking our side of the argument as well away from us, so we don't even get to participate in there. Right. But what would you say is the the plaguing intrusive feeling that uh, or what is the fear that you're that you're feeling? Yeah. Um, if I didn't bring my other dog to the vet when he ate those flowers, he would have definitely died. And everything online about Adderall says it's poisonous, like even if he didn't eat it I'd rather just do that but then it's like I feel like I'm overwhelming myself thinking like oh he'll die right yeah. well it seems it seems like you you looked at the situation you saw that there was a danger and you took action to protect your doggy all right <laughs> and you already did it right yeah I'm like here right now um yeah so I you already did it so so it's better now that you've already made the decision and you're, and you're there. It's better to support yourself in, in, in your decision because maybe it saves a dog's life. And if it doesn't, then you only just lost what the, the gas money to get there. So it's yeah. a reasonable, you're, you're, you're doing what you believe to be best. See, this is exactly, this plays in well because it's, it's not that there's a right and a wrong. You have to search for basically what can you live with? What's going to be the most beneficial? And at the end of the day, if you decided, you know, it's not that there's a right and a wrong here, but I would feel better in the end if I took them to the vet, then you've made your choice. And that's, okay. that's reasonable. Yeah. That's good thinking. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for saying that. Um, 
I mean, you've helped me so much uh, and there's always room to grow. So now I guess like the next step is feeling more confident in my thought process. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you, you made, you made your decision. That's there's nothing wrong with your decision. Your decision is not the wrong decision. Cool. Thanks Roman. Thank you. And, Thanks for being And everyone honest. for listening. <laughs> yeah. And, and we hope everything turns out good and we're, we're glad the dog is okay. Yeah, he's fine, actually. <laughs> it was more me. But that's, yeah, that's a good happy ending. Good. Awesome. <laughs> that's a happy ending.